Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 26. In this part, I'm going to talk about potential and kinetic energy as it relates to gravity. The law of conservation of energy is one of the most fundamental laws of physics. A conservative force is one where no energy is gained and none is lost. Energy is always conserved. The notion of energy was not understood until the middle of the 19th century. There were inklings that predated Newton. The experiments that Galileo performed with balls rolling down inclined planes only gave hints. It wasn't until later that energy was better understood. I talked about Galileo's law of falling bodies in part 13, where he did experiments with inclined planes. He found that a ball would roll down one inclined ramp and then proceed to roll back up the other to the same height. He never observed it going all the way to the same height. He took great care to minimize friction, which is a non-conservative force. He surmised that in the absence of friction, his rolling balls would oscillate back and forth forever, always reaching the same height. This animation demonstrates that. The first downward inclined ramp is at 60 degrees. The upward one on the right is at 45 degrees with a horizontal plane in the middle. No matter the angle, as long as it was less than 90 degrees, the ball would always reach the same height. What if there was no up ramp? Galileo concluded that the ball would roll horizontally forever. This is the basis of his law of inertia. With the law of inertia, we can see why the ball rolls up the second ramp to the same height. At the horizontal section, the ball has an inertia that carries it up the upward ramp. Since the ball always reaches the same height, there's something conserved in this process. That conserved quantity is energy. There are two types of energy, potential and kinetic. When the ball is placed at the starting position, we say it has potential energy and no kinetic energy. Potential energy is energy the ball has by virtue of its position. When the ball is released, it starts rolling downward. As it rolls down, it loses both height and picks up speed. When it reaches the horizontal section, it's lost all of the potential energy it's going to lose. The potential energy has been transformed into another form of energy. In the place of potential energy, the, now, the ball now has energy of motion. We call the energy of motion kinetic energy. As the ball continues ascending the second ramp, it slows down, losing its kinetic energy, but in return, regaining its potential energy. When the ball finally comes to rest at the top of the second ramp, all of its kinetic energy is gone and has been transformed back into potential energy. Because the ball's height is precisely what it was at the beginning, it has the same potential energy on the right as it did on the left. Before the experiment was run, Galileo would have had to lift the ball to its starting position. In doing that, he applied a force that opposed gravity. That's what gave the ball its initial potential energy. When he released the ball, the force of gravity caused it to accelerate down the ramp. At the horizontal section of the ramp, its inertia made it roll horizontally at, and at a constant speed. Inertia then carries it back up the second ramp. The ball slows down on the up ramp because its inertia now opposes the force of gravity. Gravity eventually makes the ball stop moving. To formalize this, I need to relate energy to forces. I do that with the concept of work. Work is an energy transfer of one form to another carried out by a force acting over time and distance. The simple case is a constant force of magnitude F that moves an object at distance H in line with a force. The work done, W, by the force is defined as the force times the displacement H. There's nothing complex about this. The concept of work relates force to energy. Work force and energy are ways we can account for things that move, what we call dynamics. If you lift an object of mass M and put it at rest after you lift it, then the lifting force has to counteract the force of gravity and thus is equal to the weight M of the object times minus G, the force required to oppose the gravitational acceleration. Mg is the gravitational force at the surface of the Earth, which close to the surface is constant. Since F the force equals M times minus G, the work done to raise the object to height H, height H equals M times minus GH. That's force times displacement. Note that G is a downward force and in this coordinate system is a negative number. If I lift an object up, 
I'm going against that force, so I'd have to take the negative of G, then it, which ends up being a positive number because it's a negative of a negative. The work W goes into potential energy. Let's call that U. U thus equals M minus GH. I can express that more concisely as minus MGH. Again, that ends up being a positive number. If there's going to be a conservation of energy, then whatever work I put in has to be accounted for somehow. Think of the work as being converted into potential energy. With a conservative force, you always get back any work you put in. Putting an object on a table is like putting a ball at the top of a ramp. That sets up Gal the beginning of Galileo's experiments. The dimensions of work are force times distance. The SI units the SI unit of work is the joule, which, since it measures force times distance, is one newton meter. Recall that newtons are kilogram meters per second squared. A joule is then kilograms meters squared per second squared. Watts expressed the rate of energy conversion or transfer with respect to time. It's the number of joules performed per second. That equates to newton meters per second, which is equivalent to kilogram meters squared per second cube. A joule would then equal a watt second. Other units are the foot pound, which equals 1.3558 joules, and the erg, which is 10 to the minus seventh joules. One joule is 10 million ergs. I want to be careful with units here. The acceleration g is minus 9.81 meters per second squared. That means the force f for gravity is a negative number. In this coordinate system, a falling ball will go in a negative direction. That makes sense because in a typical coordinate system, the vertical axis is positive at the top and negative at the bottom. Potential energy requires work that goes against the force of gravity, hence the potential energy here is positive. In his experiment, Galileo first lifts the ball to a height h, performing work on it by applying a force against the force of gravity. Here the work represents a transfer from the world outside the ball on the ramp, namely from Galileo, to the ball on the ramp. Since the ball is placed at rest at the top of the ramp, all the work goes into potential energy. The ball remains stationary until gravity starts it down the ramp. Galileo's law of falling bodies starts with potential energy. At the top of the ramp, U equals minus MGH. Next, Galileo releases the ball. Acting solely under the force of gravity, the ball rolls down the incline. During this stage, gravity is the force that performs work on the ball. Our theory is that energy is conserved all the way down the ramp to the bottom. The work going down the ramp represents a transfer from potential to kinetic energy. On the horizontal section, gravity has no effect. Both the potential and kinetic energy stay the same. The horizontal ramp keeps the ball from falling further. It thus travels at a constant velocity along the horizontal section to the beginning of the upper ramp. The ball then rolls back up the upper ramp, gradually slowing down and reaching its original height. Along the way, as the ball was rolling up, there was a transfer of energy back from kinetic to potential energy. That's the same as saying the ball slows down as it gets higher. At its peak, it pauses and is stationary momentarily. At its peak, it reaches the same height it started from. That means that the potential energy is the same as when it started. If the potential energy at the start were minus mgh, then when the ball reaches the same height on the up ramp, the potential energy at the finish is minus mgh. It didn't actually happen this way with Galileo's experiments. Frictional forces slowed the ball down, which meant it never came back to the same height. Galileo suggested that in the absence of friction, however, the ball would have reached the same height. When the ball reaches the bottom of Galileo's incline, where the height h equals zero, it will have lost all its potential energy, u. In reality, the ball still has potential energy, however. If this apparatus is on a tabletop, the ball could conceivably fall to the floor. If Galileo was in a two-story building, the ball could have rolled down the stairs. In fact, the only place where the potential energy would be zero would be at the center of mass of the Earth. Even then, the zero point for potential energy could be the center of the solar system or the center of the galaxy. I arbitrarily set the horizontal section as a reference for zero potential energy. It's arbitrary and could be set at any point. If the ball were to fall off the horizontal ramp and hit the floor, then the potential energy would go negative. It's okay for potential to take on negative values. In fact, for gravitational potential energy, the convention is that it always be negative. I'll show you more about that in the next section. 
Kinetic energy is always zero or positive. Once the ball gets down to the zero point, all the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy, K. Because energy is conser conserved, I can know exactly the magnitude of K at the bottom. It will be equal to U at the top. K is the energy of motion, but in this formulation, there's no connection between kinetic energy and motion. In this equation for K, I've expressed the kinetic energy in terms of position. While that gives me the right value, it doesn't express K as a measure of motion. I can resolve that with a little bit of algebra. What I'm after is a function in the form of k of v that will equal something times velocity or velocity to some power. Motion can be characterized by velocity or acceleration. By definition, if something is moving, then it has kinetic energy. I'm going to suggest that this function be a function of velocity. Let's assume that rather than traveling on an incline, the ball drops straight down. That's a simple case that makes the math much easier. I'll get back to compound motion in the next section. Here's the displacement vector P. This is displacement in the Y direction. Since I took away the ramp, there's no horizontal component of motion. There's only vertical motion. I'm using P instead of the term H here. The zero point in this coordinate system is at the tail of this displacement vector. Hence, when the ball hits that point, P will equal zero. Potential energy is minus M times G times P. G is gravitational acceleration and points downward. Thus, U, the potential energy is minus um, MGP, so if G is negative, then U is a positive number. The potential energy at the top is minus MGP top, and since the ball isn't moving at the top, there's no kinetic energy. Thus, all of the energy E is potential energy. The formula for position that I derived in the previous part is P equals P0 plus V0T plus 1 half AT squared, and I derived this in part 13. Velocity is acceleration times time, and is thus equal to g times t. The initial position p0 is p top, the initial velocity is 0, and the acceleration is g. And I'll make all those substitutions here. The velocity term disappears, and I'm left with this. If I subtract p top from both sides of this equation, I get this. Here I'm multiplying both sides by g. On the right, gt squared g squared t squared equals gt squared, and v equals gt, so I can make that substitution. Now I'm multiplying both sides by m, and then I'll expand out the terms on the left by multiplying each of them times mg. Minus mgp equals u, and mgp top equals u top, which equals e. So I'll make those substitutions here. u is uh, minus u since the term above was positive mgp. If I add u to both sides, I get this. Total energy E equals u plus 1 half mv squared. And because total energy equals potential plus kinetic energy, k equals 1 half mv squared. So I'll put that up here and I can get rid of this. Kinetic energy is now a function of velocity. Now, I want to go back to this equation and solve for v. Here I'm multiplying both sides by 2. I want to consider the case where P is at the bottom. If P is at the bottom, then V is at the bottom as well. By convention, P bottom is zero, so that term disappears. If I take the square root, I get that V bottom equals plus or minus the square root of minus two G P top. And remember, G is a negative number, which means the term under the radical is positive. If I know the starting position, then from this equation, I can determine the velocity at the bottom. If the ball is falling, the velocity would be at the bottom would be negative. In the minute, however, I'm going to show you a ball rising and falling. In that case, the initial velocity is not zero, hence it's positive. Hence, the equation for velocity at the bottom is plus or minus the square root of minus 2 gp at the top. If I go back a step, I can divide both sides of that equation by minus 2g. If I know the velocity at the bottom, I can determine the starting position at the top. Said another way, this tells me how high I need to place the ball in order to achieve a velocity of v bottom. This too will be a positive number. Going back to this equation, the velocity at any given point p is plus or minus 2g times p minus p top. P minus P top is the amount the ball has fallen. 
Going back to this equation again, I can multiply both terms on the left by 2g and then add 2gp top to both sides. If I divide both sides by 2g, I get the p, the position, is v squared plus 2gp top over 2g. 2g minus p top equals v bottom squared. I can make that substitution. So, um, and by the way, 2g, 2g p top equals <clears throat> minus v bottom squared. So the, the position v equals v squared minus v bottom squared over 2g. So if I know the velocity at any given point, I can determine the position. Let's see how this works in this animation. At the start of the experiment, the ball has no kinetic energy since it's not moving. All it has is potential energy. U equals minus mgp top, k equals 1 half mv squared, and because v at the top is 0, k equals 0. As the ball rolls down the down ramp, it loses height, hence it's losing potential energy. At the same time, it's picking up speed, so it's gaining kinetic energy. At the bottom, it's lost all of its potential energy and has nothing but kinetic energy. At the bottom, u equals minus mgp bottom. And here, p bottom is 0, the arbitrary 0 point. Thus, u equals 0. Velocity is now at its maximum, and k equals 1 half mv squared. On the horizontal ramp, energy must be conserved. Remember, I hyp hypothetically have no friction in this experiment. Because all I have here is kinetic energy, the ball must roll horizontally at a constant velocity v bottom. That's why if there were no up ramp, the ball would roll forever. On the up ramp, as the ball rolls up, it slows down and at the same time gains height. At any point, the potential energy is minus mgp, where p is the height of the ball, and the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, where v is the velocity at that height. If you add the potential energy u to the kinetic energy k for any arbitrary point a, it equals the sum of potential energy u plus kinetic energy k at any other point b. The work done from a to b is the difference in the kinetic energy at a and b, which is ka minus kb. The ball would be rolling slower at a and faster at b, hence kb is greater than ka, so the work done is negative work. The work was done by the gravitational force, which is a negative force, so this makes sense. In terms of potential energy, as the ball drops, it loses potential energy. It had more potential energy at A and less at B because it's falling. The work done from A to B in terms of potential energy is thus minus UA minus UB. If G is negative, then minus MGP is positive, and since UB is greater than UA, the work from A to B has to be minus UA minus UB. Since both of these equal the work done from A to B, then Ka minus Kb equals minus Ua minus Ub. I can express that as Ka minus Kb equals Ub minus Ua. I reverse Ua and Ub and took away the negative sign. I can then express that as Ua plus Ka equals Ub plus Kb. That's the law of the conservation of energy. Since Ua plus Ka equals Ub plus Kb, that equals a constant. This is the total energy in the system or the total energy of the ball at any point. I can use that constant to derive kinetic energy if I know the potential energy or vice versa. And that's the equation down here. The conservation of energy implies that the sum of potential energy and kinetic energy at any given point is the same at any other given point. Hence, it's constant. The concept of kinetic energy and the conservation of momentum was originally conceived by Emily du Chatelet. She was a French mathematician, physicist, and author during the Age of Enlightenment. Her crowning achievement is considered to be her translation and commentary on Isaac Newton's work, Principia of Mathematica, which was published in 1759, ten years after her death. Hers is the standard translation in French. Voltaire, one of her lovers, admired her work and treated her as a peer, despite the fact that women were treated as second-class citizens. She combined the theories of Gottfried Leibniz and the practical observations of William Gravisande to show that the energy of a moving object is proportional not to its velocity, as had previously been believed by Newton, Voltaire, and others, but to the square of its velocity. Gravisande dropped balls from varying heights into clay. He then measured how far they penetrated. With Galileo's equations, he was able to determine the speed at the bottom 
and he measured the penetration depth in the clay. He found the penetration depth was proportional to the height the ball was dropped from. When he plotted height versus penetration depth, he found a linear relationship. I showed you before that V, the velocity at the bottom, is the square root of minus 2 GP. If P equals 1, then velocity at the bottom is minus 2 times minus 9.81 times 1. And that equals minus 4.483 meters per second. If the ball falls 2 meters, it lands with a velocity of 6.26 meters per second. When Gravisande grasped the height versus depth of the, the ball went into the clay, he discovered this linear function. The slope of the function depended on the density of the clay. So in a notional sense, as he doubled the height, the depth into the clay doubled. Likewise, if he decreased the height by half, the depth in the, in the clay decreased by half. That's how a linear function works. The depth of the depression in the clay was thus a function of the potential energy. With the exception of Leibniz, people like Newton believed that energy was indistinct from momentum and therefore was linearly proportional to velocity. If this were true, then the deformation of the clay would have had to have been proportional to the square root of the height from which the balls were dropped, and it wasn't. If you plot the starting position versus velocity, you'd come up with this curve. This is an exponential function. The height is thus proportional to the square of the velocity at the bottom. Emily de Chatelet recognized the implications and concluded that energy was proportional to velocity squared. And she was right. I've shown you before that kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. She was the first person in history to describe the concept of energy and to quantify its relationship to mass and velocity squared. From that, she derived the notion of conservation of energy. Potential energy can only occur where there is an attractive or repulsive force. Gravity is an attractive force. These lines are force lines. The density of the arrows represents the strength of the force. As you move away from the source of attraction, the field density diminishes. This is one way of representing the 1 over r squared law. The field lines extend out to infinity. You'd measure a field with a test mass. It's better to use one that is significantly smaller than the field source Otherwise, the test mass gravitational force interacts with the central bodies. Another kind of a field is an electric field. If we change the central body from a mass to a positively charged particle, it sets up an electric field. If we place a negatively charged particle in the field, it will experience an attractive force. Electric fields are both attractive and repulsive. If we were to place a positively charged particle in this field, the arrows would go in the opposite direction. Here's an electric field with one positive and one negative charged particles. The charges here are equal. The field lines end up looking like this. This is called a dipole. Another type of field is a magnetic field. With, magnet, with magnetism, polarity has to come in pairs. You have to have a north with a south. You can't have a single north pole. Magnetic and electric fields are both attractive and repulsive. Gravity is only attractive. Potential energy represents the ability to do work, and work, as we said, is force times displacement. Potential energy only exists within a field. Put a test mass or test particle in an area where there's no field and there's no potential. Put a test mass within proximity of another mass, and the two will interact. From a distance, the mass has the potential to fall in. Likewise, put a charged particle in an electric field, and it has the potential to either move inward or outward. The same is true of a magnetic field. So where in the universe is there no potential? Well, really, nowhere. It's hypothetical. Gravitational fields extend out to infinity, so do electromagnetic fields. Since there's mass all over the universe, you find, find an area where gravity is weak, but you never escape it entirely. With electric fields, you can conceivably create an environment where the charge is neutral. But since there are electric field differentials all over the universe, a neutrally charged part of the universe probably doesn't exist. I want to compute some values based on these equations. I'm going to start with the ball and give it an initial velocity, a positive 70 meters per second against a gravitational acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared. The ball will rise to an apex at a certain height in a certain amount of time, and then it will fall again. This is straight line vertical motion and constant gravitational acceleration. 
And remember, the zero position is arbitrary. If zero were the ground, the ball would fall to the ground and stop. If the zero point didn't have some solid object in the way, the ball would keep falling. Here are the equations I use for that animation. I can compute the height at the apex with this equation. Here I'm plugging in values. The velocity at the bottom is 70 meters per second, and the gravitational acceleration is minus 9.81 meters per second squared. That equals 4,900 divided by 19.62, and that equals 249.75 meters. I can compute the time it takes to get to the apex as well. I'll do that by plugging in values for this equation. That looks like this. I have a value for P top, so I can plug that in too. I want to subtract 249.75 from both sides, so I can use a quadratic equation. You will recall from algebra that if I have an equation in this form, I can use the quadratic formula to derive x, or t in this case. Here's what that looks like with values plugged in. The term under the radical equals zero, so that simplifies this greatly. If I do these calculations, it equals 7.136 seconds. If you look closely at this equation, it's v0 over g. Here I'll compute the initial kinetic energy. It's 1 half mv0 squared. To simplify this, I'll assume a mass of one kilogram. I'll plug in numbers for mass and velocity. That's 4,900 over two, and that equals 2,450 kilogram meters squared per second squared, or 2,450 joules. Kinetic energy at the bottom equals potential energy at the top, and that equals minus mgp top. That equals minus one times minus 9.81 times 249.75, and that equals 2,450 joules. I also derived this equation, V bottom equals 2 GB top. Here I'm plugging in values, and that equals 70 meters per second. So I can compute the velocity if I know the height I want to reach. If I want to know the height when the velocity is 35 meters per second, I can use this equation that I derived earlier. P equals V squared minus B at the bottom squared divided by 2G. I'll plug in values here, and that equals 187.3 meters. If I want to know the velocity when the height is 100 meters, I'd use this equation that I derived earlier. V equals 2G times P minus P top. I'll plug in values here, and that equals 54.2, oh, that should be, yes, 54.2 meters per second. Here I'm going to show you how I did the animation on the previous slide in Python. Okay, I'm going to call in the libraries that I want to use, and here I'm just using matplotlib. And then these are parameters just to set the font of the uh, diagram, oh, and that should be set font for figure, and the figure size. And I'll call this kinematics. And that sets the color. And I want to set up this graph in a grid because I'm going to have multiple plots. And the first plot is going to be position. And then this is the container for the actual points, the XY points. And then since I know that the ball is going to go up about 245 meters, I'll set the y limit from 0 to 260, and I'm setting x to minus 10 plus 10. Um, I didn't really have to do that because this is all vertical motion, but I, I did that arbitrarily. I'll call this point P, and I want to display the grid on the plot. Okay, so I'll show you what that looks like. There, pretty simple plot.
Okay, so the initial position is going to be 0, P0. So I'm starting at the bottom. The initial velocity is 70 meters per second. And the acceleration is g, which is minus 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, and then ignore that comment about adding horizontal components. That's where you would put them if you wanted them. Uh, I'm going to make the mass one kilogram, which essentially takes mass out of the equation. And then the energy or the kinetic energy at the bottom is one half m v zero squared. And so that's the total energy of the system. The max height is kinetic energy at the bottom divided by g. So now I, ha I know how high the ball will go or the object. The time at the top is minus v0, div v0 divided by g, which I derived that on the previous slide. And then the maximum potential energy is m times g times h at the top. And I showed you that on the previous slide. All right, and I want to put the plot show call down here. And I'm using this to keep track of the time. And I want to display the position as a metric. And then here I'm going to display the energy, both um, E and U and K. E, total energy, U, potential energy, and K, kinetic energy. And this will trigger the animation, so I need an animate function. I'll put that there. And it's 1,500 frames at um, 10 intervals each. So this runs for 10 seconds. So the time is um, I divided by 100 um, and then just the two digits. And then here's the equation for the position P. P equals B0 plus V0T plus 1 half AT squared. And I set A equal to G earlier. Velocity is V0 times A times T. And then this is constant acceleration, so I don't need to do anything with the velocity here. I'll update kinetic energy. K equals 1 half mv squared. And I computed the v above. Potential energy is minus m times g times p. And so I take the negative of that because p is a negative number. mgh would have been positive. And the total energy is U plus K. And there's U and K. And that should be constant for all the times. OK, so I put in a little bit of logic here. If the ball falls below the zero point, I'm going to stop the animation. So while P is greater than or equal to zero. I want to set the position point in the uh, graph to P. I'm going to set the time text to the current time. And then the position text. I'm going to show position, velocity, and H top and T top. And then I'm going to show all the energies, E and U and K. And I'll save that.
And then I need to return all those values. So if I run this, you see the ball goes up to 249.75 meters. It pauses and then it falls back down. And notice E is constant. U and K change. And right there, U went to about zero. I'll show that to you again. And if you look closely, you can see kinetic energy going to zero, as does velocity when you get to the top. Okay, so that's a basic animation. Okay, here I want to add some plots for position, velocity, and acceleration. All right, so I, I made this wider, so I have some room. And this is how you add um, other panels. All right, so I made the, the whole plot wider, and then when I modify the subplot parameters, it put the position graph into one quadrant. Here's the velocity plot, and you can see that it is down on the right. And then this is all the parameters for that velocity plot. So here I'm just going through the mechanics of adding these. I don't have any data in there yet. And I'll, I need to set up vectors for position, velocity, um, because I want to graph these over time. I want them to be um, continuous lines and acceleration. So what I'm essentially going to do is use time as one axis and then these vectors position, velocity, acceleration is the y-axis. Okay, so I've got everything kind of set up mechanically. All right, this is going to be the position line, the velocity line, and the acceleration line. And I need to set the vectors up as global variables because I'm going to modify them in the animate function and I want them to be maintained outside the function. So I append time to the time vector. I append acceleration, which is constant, to the acceleration vector. And I append velocity to the velocity vector. And then with each of these, I redefine those as the line. And then position to the position vector. And then I do a set data. And then I need to add those as um, arguments in the return statement. And time's going to start at zero. And I'll set limits for acceleration. I'll set limits for velocity. And now if I run this, I get nice plots. So acceleration's constant, 9.81, negative 9.81 meters per second. You can see velocity starts out at 70 meters per second it goes to zero, and then when the ball falls back down, it goes negative, and then in the position graph, I get a nice parabolic shape.
All right, and here I'm going to add some plots for um, energy. And within the plot, I'm going to include um, total energy, potential, and kinetic. So I'm going to add a fourth row on that right-hand side. And then I need vectors for energy, kinetic, and potential. And then there's the plot for energy, and it's going to be on the bottom. And these are the containers for the energy line, the kinetic energy line. and the potential energy line. And I'll set the initial values in each of the vectors. So on the bottom of the beginning, all the energy is kinetic energy, potential is zero. So the defaults in the beginning are pretty easy. Then I have to make those global variables so I can modify them in the animate routine and have those persist. And then here I'm going to update the vectors. All right, that's energy, so I'll append um, the energy I just computed above to the energy vector and set the line. Likewise, with kinetic energy, I'll append K to the K vector and set the data for K line and then append U for the U vector. And then I need to add those as arguments in the return statement. All right, now you get a graph and you can see the energy is constant at 2,500, but the um, kinetic energy is decreasing, potential energy is increasing, and then they do the opposite. So the blue line, total energy is always conserved and uh, kinetic plus potential equals always equals total as they change. The main takeaways from this part are the notions of work, energy, and energy being broken up into potential and kinetic energy and how for conservative force, um, energy is constant and is always conserved, hence it's a conservative force. So while kinetic energy and potential energy can vary, the sum of the two is always constant.